We have a three pack of Nintendo news to drop for you today. A legend appears to be hanging up his, well, development boots, maybe, at least temporarily. We also have some information on the split of digital and physical game sales worldwide in 2022. And I'm not so sure you guys are going to take this news very well. Also, we have an official update on Joy-Con Drift, a legal update that may or may not affect how Nintendo approaches Joy-Cons and future controllers. So stay tuned right after I let you know about our sponsor today. So our first story deals with the man himself, the myth, the legend, the one and only Masahiro Sakurai. He did an extensive interview around his YouTube channel, and during that interview, he mentioned that he is actually retired, or at least retired for now. He is just 52 years old, but his reasoning was that after making Smash for Wii U, 3DS, and Switch, he spent basically a decade straight in active development without breaks, and he feels like if he keeps up that pace, his life will just pass him by. You know, one of those situations where you wake up one day and you wonder, what the hell have I been doing? I get it. You want to actually enjoy other parts of your life, not just work. Part of this is why he's doing the YouTube channel right now, so he could share the knowledge he has gained as a developer with everyone. He didn't rule out ever making another game, and he's on record in the past saying he doesn't believe another Super Smash Bros. game can exist without him, and he would listen should Nintendo ask him to make one if they are willing to let him take it in a new direction. But he's not presently listening to any other offers from anyone else, and he is not, right now, actively developing anything. It's just his YouTube channel and enjoying life. Other tidbits from the interview, because again, this was mostly about his YouTube channel. He's thrilled with the response to his YouTube videos. He has a 99% like to dislike ratio. He does read the comments on his videos and is very pleased to see a positive response to every video he puts up. He wants his videos to be from his experience, but he does consult with Nintendo on some things. He thinks it's near impossible for any other developer to do a channel that's like his, and he doesn't have like a film crew or anything. He films everything by himself. His scripts do occasionally need approval from Nintendo, who has been very supportive in the new venture. He records nonstop through his mistakes, so a little bit behind the scenes on his process. And then he edits out the mistakes before sending the film to a video editor. He will also record all of his own gameplay, or most of it if needed. Cubist also helps with some of the gameplay recording, and 8Forge uh, handles all the translations. He also gives suggestions to Sakurai if a game isn't well known outside of Japan. He records his videos at night, so the sound of traffic is gone, but sometimes he still needs to reshoot it due to an ambulance or other you know, emergency vehicle noise. His YouTube channel may at one point come to a sudden end, sort of like his Famitsu column, but he wanted it to exist as a permanent archive of the, his work. Sakurai was the on-camera personality and voice for Sakurai Presents primarily due to budget and information accuracy, so they could have hired celebrities, but it was just a lot cheaper for Sakurai to do it himself. As for what he's beaten recently, just to remind everyone, hey, I still play games, he cleared Sonic Frontiers, Bayonetta 3, and God of War Ragnarok, and next up he's looking at Tactics Ogre, and potentially Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, although he does mention it's really hard for him to play games that take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, just because it soaks up too much of his time that he, you know, he wants to be able to do other things and not just play games all the time, so... There is that, so he's not really sure which one he's going to go to next. He is worried about the internet in general, as he feels like people are too negative and attacking each other way too often. There's some other additional details as well, but the interview is entirely in Japanese, so we're working mostly off of Push Dustin's translations over on Twitter, so shout out to him. Honestly, Sakurai is a treasure, and if he wants to take time to himself, take time to his family, take time to do the things he wants to do outside of game development, more power to him. I don't think this is the last we've seen of Sakurai as a game developer, but if it is, he's 
just letting us know that, hey, you know, he doesn't know. He might not make any more games again. And obviously, Nintendo, if they want him to do more Smash in the future, you know, I, I think they'd be lenient and sort of let him do what he wants with it. But it's going to be a completely different vision than what we're used to. So I guess time will tell. Now, our next story, this is a, a, a weird one because... Essentially, GameIndustry.biz did a ton of research, worked with a bunch of different uh, data collection firms, and they came to a conclusion on the split of digital and physical software sales. Now, notably, before I give you the percentages here, this does include Nintendo games, but it only includes Nintendo's physical sales because Nintendo does not publish their digital sales. Now, sometimes you could figure it out if you could figure out a rough estimate of their total physical compared to the total number of sales of a game reported, but they didn't do that sort of math. They're working just with exact figures and exact facts they can get from the MPD, from the various UK reports, Famitsu, and all these other organizations out there. So they're doing the best they can, but since Nintendo doesn't provide digital data, they're digital digital sales aren't included, which is kind of unfortunate because it does mean the percentage of digital to physical would actually go even higher for digital. Now, what is the percentage they came to right now? 72% of games sold in 2022 were digital, meaning only 28% were physical. And again, if Nintendo included digital sales data, chances are it's like 75 to maybe even 80% of all sales are digital, if not higher, because we obviously don't know what the percent cut of digital sales is for Nintendo. But yeah, that's a really high figure. Now, obviously, this is going to include a bunch of games that are only available digitally, so there is that, but still, it does kind of show that physical is clearly on its way out. This is a much bigger split than when it was, you know, 60-40 physical digital just 10 years ago. So I, we're getting to this point where physical releases are only really going to start to make sense for the biggest of games, but hey... This is something to pay attention to. I really hope the physical medium isn't going anywhere, but uh, time will tell. Next up, a government group in the UK has figured out what is going on with Joy-Cons and why we have Joy-Con drift. Now, we've had our theories, and, and Spawnwave did a breakdown a long time ago, and we sort of kind of know what the issues are, but we've never had it scientifically verified like we have now, so a UK consumer group did lab tests, actual lab tests on Joy-Cons, and it seems to have proven that there is an actual design flaw. It dissected five different, I know, not a huge segment, but five different Joy-Cons from different time periods of the Switch's life that all have drift to determine the cause. Now, all five of the Joy-Cons did have debris in them, suggesting Nintendo's little rubber lip is not actually adequate at keeping out debris. In fact, some people have argued that, that rubber lip actually drags debris in, so... There is that, uh, but they didn't. They didn't obviously do extensive testing to see if the rubber lips drag in debris in or not. That's more of a theory. That being said, they're not saying the debris are exactly what the issue is. Every single one of them had wear and tear on their contact pads caused by a mechanical flaw in design. So they're not even blaming the debris. They're just saying, hey, the actual contact pad that we've been theorizing was the cause of drift this whole time keeps having damage done to it and the damage is because there's a mechanical flaw in the actual design nintendo has responded to this because this is a governing body saying this so nintendo isn't going to ignore it and they said the percentage of joy con controllers that have been reported as experiencing issues with the analog stick in the past is small and we have been making continuous improvements to the Joy-Con analog stick since its launch in 2017. They notably said they, they had a, a fundamental change somewhere around the time the Switch OLED came out. I can confirm that I haven't had my OLED Joy-Con drift yet. Uh, I have, I've had two, two sets of them. One of them, the, the control stick actually broke. I, it could have been my kids that did that, so that's not a drift issue. But my other set that is so like a daily driver hasn't drifted yet and so take that for what it will. Other Joy-Cons I've had drift really under pretty light use conditions, but so maybe there is some truth to this. Nintendo also said that we expect all our hardware to perform as designed, and if anything falls short of this goal, we always encourage consumers to contact Nintendo customer support, who will be happy to openly and leniently resolve any consumer issues related to the Joy-Con controllers, analog sticks, including in cases where the warranty may no longer apply. This is interesting because they've been doing this in the United States for a while, but other territories, sometimes they'll deny your Joy-Con claims. So maybe now that this report came out in the UK, Nintendo's like, hey, we... 
we know. Okay, like they're, they're, they're not even denying that Joy-Con drifts a thing. They're trying to act like it, it affects a small percentage of controllers, but they did note they used the very key language in there, reported as experiencing, meaning that there could be a ton of people experiencing drift that just aren't saying anything, just buying new controllers, just stop playing altogether. Nintendo's aware that this is a problem. They just aren't sure how widespread it is since they don't, you know, have, you know, there's 100 plus million of these out there. 200 million plus joy cons it's not like they have 100 million people claiming drift so for them it, you know their percentage numbers on the actual repairs probably look tiny in comparison to the total sales of switch so it, that might be where they're getting those figures from but either way nintendo is acknowledging that joy con drift exists they are acknowledging uh that this you know not, this lab test is valid and that they're trying to always improve things so Take that for what it will. I have no idea. I'm, you know, our, our, if you have a Switch OLED, have your Joy Cons started drifting yet? Because last we checked when we took apart the stick, it looks like it's the same design. So I can't imagine that it's gotten better, but maybe they're using a stronger metal as an example. Because, you know, I, I didn't test metal competition. So that little contact pad could be using a stronger metal, which is much harder to damage. Maybe that's a change of it. Maybe they changed uh, the grade of the plastics and stuff, so maybe they're a bit softer and less likely to scratch. I have no idea uh, what Nintendo has done. Only Nintendo and the manufacturers truly know. But And our final little bonus story today comes from Digital Foundry's John Linneman. They did a Digital Foundry Direct Weekly. Again, they do this every single week where they go over a whole bunch of tech stuff uh, from video games all the way to PC components and everything in between. And... He brought up something that is very interesting when it comes to Switch Pro or a next generation Switch. What is Nintendo doing? So here's what he said, and I quote, So I think at one point internally, from what I can understand from talking to different developers, is that there was some sort of mid-generation Switch update planned at one point. And that seems to no longer be happening and thus it's pretty clear that whatever they do next is going to be an actual next generation hardware now when reading that statement it's important to understand what the facts are and what the opinions are the facts are that he has talked to a bunch of different developers and that those developers did know that there was going to be a mid-generation switch update it also seems like those developers haven't heard anything from nintendo on this update in some time suggesting that it's been canned and thus his opinion is that whatever nintendo is doing next is going to be next generation hardware this isn't what his developer said is developer sources didn't tell him, oh, Nintendo's next thing is going to be next generation hardware. They told him that, hey, we know that this was going to be a thing. Not so sure now. Hey, you do with that what you will. And John Lemon gave his professional opinion. So take that for what you will. There's going to be a lot of headlines out there about this. It doesn't really tell us anything. If we're completely honest, it doesn't give us any more information other than, hey, somebody... Some developers talked about Switch Pro lately, and I guess the opinion is it's not going to come out, but who knows? Anyways, folks, you guys let me know what you think about all these stories down in the comments below. I am Nathaniel RoboJans from Nintendo Prime. I hope you really enjoyed this video. If you did, I would appreciate it if you drop a like and subscribe to the channel for more Nintendo news, Nintendo facts from our shorts, and more Zelda goodness. I have a Zelda video still dropping later today as well. Uh, we're going to be diving into... Is Tears of the Kingdom going to be the darkest Zelda yet? Why or why not? Well, I'm going to get into this because AJ Anomo himself opened his mouth. All right, guys, we'll catch you later. Bye.